Hello and welcome to the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research webinar, A Nurse's Guide to Pancreatic Cancer from Diagnosis to Treatment. My name is Amy Reese and I am the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Hirschberg Foundation. Aggie Hirschberg, our founder, is here too and looks forward to saying hello at the end of the webinar. Please ask your questions either during or after the slide presentation by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type and submit your question. We will open the discussion for all after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, pancreatic.org. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters, Lauren D'Amato and Megan Price, two distinguished nurse practitioners with UCLA Health who have many years of experience in the pancreatic cancer, surgery, and oncology departments. Lauren is the nurse coordinator and nurse practitioner for the Aggie Hirschberg Center for Pancreatic Diseases. And Megan is an oncology nurse practitioner with the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you, Lauren and Megan, for joining us today. We are so appreciative of you sharing this valuable information and for all that you do for the pancreatic cancer community. Welcome. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you, Amy, Aggie, and the foundation for allowing us to present um, our perspective on caring for these patients um, with pancreatic cancer. Um, a couple of weeks ago when Amy had asked me and Megan to present our perspective of caring for these patients, it was a kind of a daunting topic because we just see so many sides of everything. We see the patient's perspective, we see the other provider's perspective, so we both kind of thought, what, what could we do to serve this community um, best? And I kind of just kind of reflected on the questions I get most and you know, the concerns that I address uh, the most um, from the patients that I come in contact with. Um, and the first thing that everybody kind of asks me is, could this have been prevented? Um, we are learning more and more about this disease and we're developing new treatments and different ways of caring for patients. Um, but mostly, you know, we want to identify risk factors and maybe even a screening program like colon cancer or breast cancer to prevent this from happening or at least catch this in the earlier stages. And we're not quite there yet, but we have made some advances. Um, we have identified risk factors, some that are modifiable and then some that are not. Um, we know that family history can play a, a, a part in this, and we know that a familial component is present in about 10% of the cases. We know that a first degree relative um, increases a person's risk of pan developing pancreatic cancer by four fold. And then if a person has two first degree relatives, the increase actually um, go, increases to 6.4 fold. And then we also know that genetic mut mutations um, are, play a part in this. However, 80% of the patients with pancreatic cancer do not have a genetic mutation. So risk factors um, that have been identified, um, one is tobacco use, obesity, type two diabetes, and then chronic pancreatitis, which actually carries a 7.2 fold increase in developing this disease. There are environmental and chemical exposures that can contribute age. Um, the average age of diagnosis uh, with pancreatic cancer is 70. And then race, we know the African-American population has a higher incidence of pancreatic cancer. And then as discussed, family history and then inherited uh, genetic syndromes. There's been a few genetic mutations that have been identified um, that increases the risk. Um, most common one that probably everybody has heard just because of its relation to breast cancer is the BRCA1 and 2 mutation. This is part of the hereditary breast and ovarian syndrome. And then the PALB2 uh, gene, also part of the hereditary breast cancer. These three uh, mutations are actually kind of important to know if a patient has, because not only does that increase a person's risk for developing pancreatic cancer, but also can determine different treatment options um, if they develop pancreatic cancer. Other um, mutations um, are P16 and the CDK, which is part of the familial atypical multiple mole uh, melanoma syndrome, and then PRSS1 gene, which is um, familial pancreatitis, and then Lynch syndrome genes uh, that are HNPCC, MLH1 and MSH2. 
and mostly um, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. And then the STK11 gene, which is associated with putz jaeger syndrome, and then an ATM mutation. So now that we've identified these genetic mutations, um, what do we do? Um, do we genetically test everyone to see if that they have these genetic mutations in hopes that we can you know, screen these pers uh, people and possibly catch this cancer in an earlier stage? The NCCN guidelines now recommend that anyone um, with a confirmed pancreatic cancer should have germline testing. Usually this is done with a blood sample or even a saliva sample. Um, and this is usually done in conjunction with a visit with a genetic counselor. The International Cancer of the Pancreas Screening or CAPS Consortium has met and provides a recommendation for surveillance and screening as well. So the CAPS study is the International Cancer of the Pancreas Screening Consortium. They first met in 2011 to establish guidelines for surveillance of individuals with familial or inherited risk. They met again in 2018 to update their guidelines in light of new uh, research and uh, information. They uh, operate on the assumption that early detection is the most effective way to improve survival. And then individuals with strong family history and or genetic sus susceptibility uh, have an increased risk of developing pancreatic cancer. So this chart is here, um, it's part of the CAF study. It's a little hard probably for everyone to see, but if you look on the left-hand side, it lists the genes that I've listed on the previous slide. And basically on the right-hand side, it shows the grade of evidence in which a person should undergo um, pancreatic uh, screening, pancreatic cancer screening. So basically if you have a BRCA2 mutation and at least one first degree relative um, or two effective relatives of any degree, you should enter a high risk screening program. Um, also, if you have putz jaeger syndrome, regardless of family history, um, it's a grade one recommendation that you undergo surveillance as well. And then there's some of the other um, mutations there. And then um, regard they also list uh, screening guidelines for patients that don't have um, a mutation, um, a gene mutation, but have family history. So if you have um, at least three effective relatives with pancreatic cancer on the same side of the family, and one of them is a first degree relative, you should be considered for high risk screening. Another category is if you have two affected relatives who are first degree um, relatives of each other, and one is a first degree relative to you, um, you should also consider um, screening. So this is if you have a mother and a grandmother that both had uh, pancreatic cancer, then you should, under, you should undergo possibly genetic counseling and then um, screening. And then um, if you have two affected relatives on the same side of the family, and one is a first degree um, relative with um, pancreatic cancer, you should also be considered for surveillance. The next chart is um, now that we know that people are at high risk, um, when do we start this screening is the question and then how. So a lot of um, the evidence is, you know, you want to screen around 50 years or 10 years from the youngest person um, that was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So if you fall into a high risk um, category and the youngest person was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at 50, then you would want to start screening at 40. And then if you have other genetic mutations, um, this chart actually recommends um, other screening guidelines actually to start earlier. And the main one for that is the Peutz-Jaeger syndrome. How should this screening be done? Um, endoscopic ultrasound is probably the preferred, um, one of the preferred methods along with an MRI. Um, I know some screening programs alternate between MRI and endoscopic ultrasounds um, just to get a baseline and then they surveil in like uh, regular intervals and they alternate between the two modalities. Um, and that just really depends on your risk stratification and your screening program that you're in. So the conclusion is surveillance is recommended for those that have been identified as high risk. The intention is to detect um, lesions that are, have high grade dysplasia, which is a precursor to cancer, and then early stages of pancreatic cancer, because we know that that actually can improve survival. 
And then surveillance should take place in a multidisciplinary uh, setting and it should be utilized in combination with the most uh, recent research practices. So switching gears a little bit, now that we kind of got through the risk factors and the pre preventative um, measures, um, now we have the presentation or the symptoms that patients often present with. Um, the first one or the most common one um, is obstructive jaundice. So I get a lot of phone calls saying, yeah, I woke up one day and I noticed my eyes were yellow, my skin was yellow. Some people even tell me, you know, I noticed a couple weeks ago my stool was clay colored and my urine was the color of Coca-Cola. And then some people have itching too, which is actually a result of the bile salts kind of accumulating under the skin. Um, a lot of people will say, yeah, I've had vague abdominal pain for the last couple of months. Some people may even um, complain of back pain. Um, and then there's also unexplained weight loss as a symptom, decrease in appetite, or just a general feeling of indigestion. And then new onset diabetes are really difficult uh, to control blood glucoses. Sometimes patients will be admitted for abdominal pain, they'll get a workup, um, and the CT scan won't really say that there's a mass, but the patient has really bad pancreatitis. And sometimes we don't discover the mass until the endoscopic ultrasound portion of the workup, or in fact, in, when the inflammation of the pancreas kind of subsides, then the mass reveals itself. Sometimes, and you know, it's an incidental finding, meaning the patient either had a scan or an ultrasound for another unrelated issue and they found a pancreatic mass. So diagnostic modalities, um, you know, sometimes if the patient presents to a local physician or a gastroenterologist with jaundice or complaints of clay colored stool, they'll start with blood work, um, doing a liver function panel or hepatic function panel. And if the bilirubin is elevated or the other liver enzymes are elevated, we know that something's kind of going on. Sometimes um, if the local physician or the community physician has some insight into what's going on, they may order a CN89, which is a tumor marker for pancreatic cancer. It's a good um, screening measure and also marker for pancreatic cancer. However, not all patients with um, a pancreas mass or malignancy um, has an elevated CA99. What's the preferred measure is a CT scan, um, pancreas protocol. Uh, we like to do a triple phase CT scan with IV contrast. Um, this allows us to really evaluate the pancreas and all the structures around it, including the blood vessels. Sometimes we do use an MRI and our MRCP, especially if we're trying to look at the liver a little bit better. And then um, an EOS and a and ERCP is a scoping procedure done by our advanced endoscopy colleagues. Um, this is done through a scope that passes through the mouth, down the esophagus, and into the stomach. And this has an ultrasound probe on the end. And it allows us to look at the pancreas and um, biopsy any kind of pancreas mass that may be there. And then another scoping procedure is an ERCP. Um, this looks at the biliary system and also the pancreatic duct. Um, and then using this scope, we can actually, or they can actually put in a biliary stent to help drain um, the bile and relieve uh, the obstruction that a pancreatic mass may cause. Sometimes a patient will undergo a percutaneous biopsy. This is a needle biopsy done in radiology, either with the help of an ultrasound or a CT scan. Um, and this is really done for um, metastatic lesions in the liver. Um, um, and this helps stages the patient and also um, diagnose any kind of lesions in the liver that may be uh, metastatic. Then um, the patient, after usually they get a diagnosis, that's usually when they contact a integrated practice unit or an IPU. And this is a multidisciplinary approach to treating cancer. We know that cancer care should be provided in an efficient and systematic way, and integrated practice units um, help uh, deliver that kind of care to cancer patients. We aim, the IPU aims to provide comprehensive and centralized care involving multiple specialties. We also try in an IPU to coordinate the care of the patients, especially since at the time of diagnosis, they're usually going through so much and pretty overwhelmed with all the inflammation and the diagnosis itself that we try and help coordinate their care so it's one less thing that they have to think about. 
Also, we have um, greater knowledge of relevant and ongoing clinical trials, and then access to other treatments that, may not, uh, that might be up and coming. So we have at UCLA, the Aggie Hirschberg Center for Pancreatic Diseases. This is a center that includes a multidisciplinary conference. Um, this is held on Tuesday morning, right before patients are seen in the clinic, Tuesday afternoon. And there, this conference is as a way or uh, a place where many specialties kind of come together and review each patient and kind of puts give their input based on their specialty. And at the end of the conference, each patient kind of has a plan of what should be done, whether it's treatment, a treatment plan, or maybe they need more workup. Um, and so everybody pretty much knows um, what's going on with the patient and is on board to help them should they want to proceed with um, care. So specialties that are represented at our conference are radiology. So we have a radiologist uh, that is specializes in abdominal imaging, and she goes through all of our scans, our CT scans, our PET scans, our MRI. She even looks at our ERCP images if they're available. Then we have surgical representation, which um, at our conference, we have three to four surgeons that are present every week. Um, gastroenterology, who helps with um, the endoscopic procedures, but then also helps with any kind of GI complaints that a patient may have uh, related to this cancer. Medical oncology, um, which kind of weighs in on clinical trials and um, you know, treatment regimens with chemotherapy. Radiation oncology, um, pathology and cytopathology are there to review any kind of path uh, pathology or cytopathology specimens. And then of course the Sims Man Center is there, um, which provides a lot of resources to patients, whether it's emotional support, support groups, and then also um, the nutrition component that a lot of patients ask about. And then we have a genetic counselor that comes to our conference and reviews every case um, and kind of hand selects people um, that should have genetic uh, counseling. And then also she is really great at uh, discovering genetic results and making sure that the patients, if they've had genetic counseling or genetic testing in, in the past, that they had all the appropriate panels because this field has changed a lot in the, in the last couple of years. So going on to the treatment portion of pancreatic cancer, um, patients kind of fall into three types of buckets. Um, one, they are seen, the mass is found and they are a surgical candidate right away. Um, sometimes patients find this mass, it's diagnosed as pancreatic cancer, and maybe it's involving some of the local blood vessels. And so we know that when that is the case, they go um, to have some chemotherapy, and then we have the intention of doing surgery after a few cycles of chemotherapy, um, depending on the response from the tumor. Sometimes patients have chemotherapy, radiation, and then go to surgery. And then sometimes the last bucket is that a patient is not a candidate for surgery and that they're referred for chemotherapy. So going back up to the surgery portion of it, there's a couple of procedures that we could do to get these pancreatic masses out. And one is the Whipple procedure, and that's done for a mass that's in the head of the pancreas. The second procedure is a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy, which is done for a mass in the body or in the tail of the pancreas. And then very, very rarely do we do a total pancreatectomy, meaning we take out the entire pancreas. So this is a picture of what a Whipple procedure um, is. If you notice on the left-hand side, the picture highlights the organs that are taken out with the Whipple, uh, Whipple procedure. So everything in yellow is removed. So that's the gallbladder, the first portion of the duodenum or the small intestine, and then of course the head of the pancreas. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll see how everything is kind of reconnected after surgery. Um, so you have the head portion of the pancreas that is uh, removed and reconnected to the small intestine. And then you have um, a portion of the stomach that is um, removed and then connected to the small intestine. And then if you look up top, you'll see the bile duct um, that is also reconnected to the small intestine. So you can see you have many different connections um, after the Whipple procedure, which is why we're so um, adamant about you guys taking uh, pantoprazole or PPI to protect those connections after surgery. This is a picture of a distal pancreatectomy. Um, 
So if you see on the left-hand side, everything in yellow is what is removed. So the distal part of the pancreas and the spleen is removed. And then if you look over to the right, you'll notice the pancreas, the head portion is remaining there, and then the spleen is gone, and then the splenic artery and the splenic vein are tied off. So after surgery, the patient usually um, is, comes back to clinic around the two week mark after being di uh, discharged from the hospital. And they're presented again at our multidisciplinary conference. Um, but this time it's more of a tumor board discussion. Um, the patient is presented um, in the light of the surgery was done and now we have the mass and the tumor out and pathology will present their findings. So we look at the gross um, pictures and the pathology slides and we can see, you know, what kind of cell uh, tumor it was. Was it a poorly differentiated tumor, a moderately well differentiated tumor? Um, at this time, they'll tell us how many lymph nodes were involved, if any, if the margins were negative. And then if the patient had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, the pathologist can actually comment on whether the chemotherapy had an effect on the tumor. And then during this discussion, we also decide on what the next steps are. Um, does the patient need to go and have more chemotherapy? Should they be referred to radiation um, or do they just need surveillance? And then um, with that, I'm gonna send it over to Megan. Oh, thank you, Lauren. Um, everyone can close their eyes for a minute while I try to make sure I connect my <laughs> PowerPoint appropriately. Um, let's see here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, you look good, Megan. Great. <laughs> Okay, so as Lauren kind of introduced here, and, and first off, I want to thank Augie and Amy and everyone from the Hirschberg Foundation and Alyssa for having us as part of this. I know in a time where it's hard to feel connected, I think things like this bring us together, and I hope it provides some support for our patients as well. Um, okay, with that, I'll jump in here. So once everybody's gone through their workup, um, surgery, or deciding that they need some neoadjuvant therapy, um, I'm part of the medical oncology team, so we start to discuss what type of systemic therapy would be most appropriate um, at that point. Oh. Right now you get a preview of my entire slide. There we go. So some of the factors that we start to talk about with our patients are what type of therapy is most appropriate for that individual? You know, we don't like to use blanket discussions or blanket treatment regimens. Um, of course, there are some regimens that are more appropriate to use in the first line setting or neoadjuvant. Um, as a lot of you know, there, there are a lot of treatment regimens, but not as many as some other solid tumor sites. Um, but with that being said, the first thing that we really talk about is the goal of treatment. I think number one from a medical oncology perspective and surgery is what does the patient want? You know, if they, if aggressive treatment is appropriate and the treatment team and the patient agree on that, then that is one deciding factor that we use to move forward. Um, if a patient tells us, you know, there's certain things that they want to make it for, they need to feel well on this day. Um, these are all things that we like to take into consideration from a socioeconomic standpoint too, and just a lifestyle component. Um, if there's any underlying health conditions, that's really important too, because you want to know if there's something that's going to make that specific treatment more difficult. Um, do you have underlying neuropathy that could be complicated by some of the medications that we could use as far as chemotherapy? Um, is there cardiac, underlying cardiac problems that we need to take into consideration? So making sure as a patient that you're coming in too and bringing up all of your underlying health conditions will make sure that you get most appropriate and safest treatment for, for you as a, as a patient. Some things I think we forget about sometimes is um, transportation and lifestyle concerns. You know, if it's difficult or with work schedules, even to say, I can't come in weekly or every other week would be easier for me. These are things that can really help determine what treatment regimen is most appropriate because of course we want continuity and compliance and we want it to be um, as easy as it could possibly be. We, we realize this is a, you're uprooting your life and everything's been turned on its head in a moment like this. And we want to try to incorporate this into your lifestyle too, so that you can still enjoy some aspects of your life. Um, so that's a very important conversation to have when we're deciding on a treatment regimen. 
of course, bringing up clinical trials is, is always important, especially in our center where we do a lot of research. Um, the medical oncologist that you speak to will help you determine if that's the right step for you at that point. But as an advocate for yourself, it's always a good question to bring up. Um, whether you want to make sure that it's, you're asking that before you start any kind of therapy to make sure that it's not um, disqualifying you from a clinical trial. So the line of therapy is important, whether we're talking about this is your first treatment you've ever had, or you've had treatments before, um, of course, incorporating into your previous exposure, whether you've had, unfortunately, we have some patients that have had other malignancies previously. So we have to take into consideration what they may have experienced in the past before this diagnosis. And then, which is becoming more and more common, is this molecular profiling. So sending the tumor tissue to make sure that we evaluate for any specific mutations, as Lauren touched on, to see if there's something targetable. Um, there's a bunch of different companies now, you know, whether it's Foundation, Garden, Prothera, uh, Tempest, there's a bunch of different companies. Every institution you likes to use different ones, but that's always a good question to bring up too. Um, for some reason, sometimes there's not enough tissue, which I know people encounter. Um, there are liquid biopsies and other ways to utilize that as well. So this slide just goes over some of the different mutations you might see on some of these molecular profiling or next generation sequencing tests that we frequently do. Um, as you can see on the slide, there are, it kind of shows you the percentage of what you might see. Um, these BRAF mutations, mTOR, um, JAK12, of course, not all of these are targetable, which is, you'll hear that brought up a lot in in discussion with your medical oncologist is even though we see these mutations sometimes not all of them would be actionable. Um, some clinical trials target specific mutations but this is just an example of what you might see on a next generation sequencing or additional molecular profiling. The pancreatic cancer cell um, I think is is so difficult and I think this has been um, such an area of interest for a lot of people at the pancreatic um, in the pancreatic cancer world in general across the nation across the globe because pancreatic cancer cell is such a difficult one to invade. Um, as you can see on the slide here the blood vessels in red are very sparse and that is of course how the drug delivery happens. So some different tumor types do have more blood vessels involved and are able to um, target and have a larger amount of drug delivery into the tumor cell, which then of course targets um, or potentiates cell damage and um, invades the cell so that it can do its cytotoxic effect. Um, as you can see here, it's got a really dense, this desmoplastic stroma, which builds up a very thick barrier outside of the cancer cell. Um, there are clinical trials that we're starting to look into on how to break down this extracellular matrix or this dense stroma so that the drugs can actually get to the cancer cell easier. So that's another up and coming um, area of research that everybody's very interested in. So as Lauren talked about on her slides too about neoadjuvant treatment or before surgery. So, you know, after these conversations with the multidisciplinary team, if they decide, you know, I think we could get a little bit of a better outcome if this patient undergoes some chemotherapy first to hopefully shrink the mass off of the vessels and so we get a better, better surgical outcome. Um, this slide kind of goes over some of the uh, main treatment regimens that we use. I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of them, whether it's fulfirinox, gemcitabine with nabpaclitaxel or Braxane. Um, of course, now some of the newer guidelines are based on if there is a BRCA mutation. So this gem, um, gemcitabine and cisplatin regimen is used a lot. Um, for neoadjuvant patients, um, because we know of some of the platinum agents do target these BRCA positive patients a little bit better. Um, this is, a, and also I wanted to point out, this is an NCCN guideline for patients flow charge. So patients can go on, you know, we use the NCCN guidelines a lot to help us make decisions in the world of oncology, but there are patient guidelines as well that can really help you break down how we make our decisions too and keep you more and more involved in the conversation. Right now, you know, we have a lot of patients ask us, well, which one's better? And that's, that's a difficult decision because there is no head-to-head -head data as far as research goes comparing these regimens. Um, a lot of it goes back to what we kind of talked to earlier about 
lifestyle choices, um, transportation issue, issues, comorbidities, and choosing the regimen that we think is going to be most appropriate for you because in, in the long term, um, compliance is always, of course, very important too. We want to make sure you're able to maintain this regimen. So this chart here um, by Dr. Lee, you can see, and of course taken, this is patients, it's not specific to the initial staging, but surgery only versus surgery and adjuvant therapy and neoadjuvant therapy and surgery, as you can see here, the green line did improve um, this overall survival and a better pathologic response if we do neoadjuvant therapy before surgery. Um, of course, the staging will come into play and that's something to talk about with the surgeon and your medical oncologist. Um, of course, every, again, every patient is very an individual approach. And one thing in the, in the neoadjuvant setting that I think always can scare patients sometimes is this monitoring symptoms of disease versus treatment toxicity. We don't want people to be alarmed if, if the fatigue is getting worse or if their appetite's getting worse, that it's disease. It could simply be treatment related. So it needs to be an open conversation of these are the side effects I'm having. Um, you know, if we need to hold treatment and things get better, it needs to be an ongoing conversation to determine um, what's more likely. And if it needs to be further evaluated with repeat imaging, we of course do that. But again, it's a very individual approach. So after surgery, um, of course, as, as you can tell here, Lauren and, and I and our teams work very closely with each other. So they go back and forth between surgery, radiation, and then back to medical oncology if needed. So the adjuvant treatment or after surgery is a new conversation based off of the pathologic information received from surgery. How many lymph nodes were involved? Um, what treatment would be the most appropriate at that point? One of the most important things to consider at that time is how much neoadjuvant treatment did they get? So that's a discussion with your medical oncologist too. If the treatment was so heavy up front in the neoadjuvant setting, sometimes you don't need treatment after. Um, again, that goes back to the pathologic response and we want to make sure that we are giving you the most effective treatment before and after, but also balancing toxicity. So some of the preferred options are this gemcitabine with capecitabine um, or modified fulfirinox, which we frequently use both of those regimens here, depending on how strong the patient's feeling after surgery, how many lymph nodes were involved, all of that information. Um, evaluating residual symptoms, again, because some of these side effects, such as neuropathy, the numbness and tingling, um, fatigue, the effect on the bone marrow and the white blood cell, hemoglobin, platelets, all of that, is something to consider when you're choosing a second regimen or after treatment. You want to make sure that it's a neuropathy is really pronounced that you're not making that a lot worse and keeping that in mind as you're going through the next treatment. And then discussing a timeline um, of when to initiate surgery. You know, we have to balance that with allowing them to recover from surgery, but also not losing a window of efficacy. Um, that can vary for patients. Um, and that's something to really talk about with your medical oncologist to make sure that everyone feels comfortable about the timing of when to start the next, next round. So a little bit of a different approach is if a patient comes in, even to these multidisciplinary um, settings and they already have metastatic disease. So if, if you've already discovered that there's a little spot in the liver or somewhere else, the treatment regimens, a lot of them are very common as far as neoadjuvant or in metastatic disease. Um, again, fulfirinox, this gym cytobine abraxane, um, gym cis or gym cytobine cisplatin for these BRCA mutated patients and Olaparib or Linparza, which they are starting to use based on the POLO trial that did show efficacy for these BRCA mutated patients. Um, again, I, you know, this is all in this NCC and guidelines for, for pancreatic cancer patients. So this is accessible to you on their website too, for you to review. Um, because it is being informed and bringing these questions helps you feel more comfortable in, in your care too. Second line therapy options for metastatic cancer recurrence. Again, we're trying to, every day, the researchers are trying to make this list more extensive. Um, you can see here that some of the drugs are used um, in different lines of therapy. Again, there's trials coming out that we're trying to make this list grow, and that's a passion of all of ours, I think, to, to make this list as long as possible. But again, utilizing 
and bringing up the quality of life discussion at every point of a treatment decision. So if you're switching therapies, it's still important to bring up with your oncologist, your medical team about what your wishes are, um, what you're feeling, because we want, it needs to be an open conversation and a two-way street about how to make this the most effective, most tolerable, um, most holistic treatment for you and, and the family as well. So that's something that needs to come up each time we talk about a new treatment. Some of the lifestyle modifications on treatment, I think we get asked a lot, especially as nurse practitioners and nurses in, in the setting, is what do I need to do? Which I think is always a common question because it's hard to feel out of control in a, in a setting like this where you have people making decisions for you and kind of throwing out a lot of terms and everybody wants to know what they can do themselves to um, give them the best response possible. So one thing we want, and, is to avoid any big drastic dietary changes. You know, now is not the time. And of course, this talking to a nutritionist at the beginning, we don't want any large lifestyle modification dietary changes that are going to make you drop a lot of weight before we start treatment or do any kind of surgery. Um, talk to the nutritionist, talk to your medical oncologist before making any large lifestyle modifications. Um, Again, the referral to the dietitians here are wonderful. A lot of them are very experienced with oncology patients in particular, which so they can really help hone in on the changes that would be most helpful. Um, transitioning to multiple small meals during the day is important. You don't want to overload your system and this will help you break it down, help your body um, not feel so overwhelmed with a large amount of food at once and help you be able to absorb more nutrients and um, multiple times during the day versus trying to eat one large meal and then you're miserable for the rest of the day and having trouble digesting it. While you're eating or choosing whatever you want for that day, we want you to get the most bang for your buck. So try to get the most nutrients, the most calories, the most protein into whatever you're eating. You know, water is always great, but if you can do something with electrolytes in it so that you're getting that as well, it's always helpful so you're not filling up on something that's not providing you with a lot of nutrients. Um, protein shakes we're big proponents of and the, and the nutritionists are very good about helping you um, determine what you're missing in your diet too that could make you feel better. Listening to your body um, I think is a, is a difficult conversation for a lot of patients and family members always want to be very helpful in trying to help with um, caloric intake and, and how to make their loved ones stronger, make the patient stronger, but listening to your body and you know your limits, um, making sure that you're taking anti-nausea medications before you eat and to, so that way you make sure that you're um, able to tolerate the food as well as possible and just knowing what your limits are because the last thing you want is to push yourself too far and then you end up feeling sick from it because we still want the food relationship to be a positive one or at least a tolerable one. Once you get into the negative headspace of eating, it does become a psychological component that we need to break. So if, you're ha if anybody's having trouble eating, I think we tell our patients all the time, we need to know if you're nauseous or you're, you're nauseous just thinking about eating food, we need to break that cycle somehow. So having an open conversation with that is helpful. Taking anti-nausea medications appropriately. Um, if you have it at home and they're not working, I think one thing we always try to be very transparent about is if what you have isn't working, tell us, because we have a huge arsenal of things we can try, um, but we don't know that we need to change things up if we don't know that it's not working. So having that line of communication about, I've tried this, it's not working, we need to try something else and keep troubleshooting until we find a combination that's appropriate for, for that particular patient. Make sure you're avoiding prolonged diarrhea and vomiting. Um, I know I've heard sometimes that patients feel like they're cleansing the treatment from their body um, by allowing the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea to continue. Um, we really don't want that. Your body's not cleansing it at that point. You need to support your body and slow down this volume loss because you're losing electrolytes, you're losing nutrition. Um, we need to slow that down by flushing your system with different electrolyte drinks and water and, and different types of intake, that's how you can really support your body going through treatment. Um, anticipatory nausea and vomiting, I think is something that happens a lot and it's not talked about that often, but coming into treatment, even if you are the strongest person in the world, nobody wants to be here and we're very cognizant of that. 
So coming in and not really in, feeling nervous on your way into treatment and feeling nauseous the night before or the morning of coming in, there are treatments for that. And it's really important to bring that up to your treatment team. Um, because there's, if there's some way that we can tweak it and help you tolerate treatment better and not have this psychological component of not wanting to come in there, which makes you feel physically ill, um, there are things we can do about that. Sims Man, of course, can talk to you about the more um, the coaching and, and the psychosocial support, but there are medications that we can use to help too. Um, so again, it goes all goes back to just making sure that you're informing your treatment team. Some of the side effects, which we've kind of touched on, but for each particular regimen, um, fulfirinox, which is one of the most common treatment regimens we use, whether it's neoadjuvant, adjuvant, or in the metastatic setting, um, these the different drugs that we use, the 5-FU, um, oxaliplatin, or ranitecan, have very um, expected side effects, and we know what to expect um, and explain to the patient. So with the 5-FU or pump that many of you are familiar with, fatigue is a very common side effect of it, um, especially the day the pump comes off and a couple of days after is very, um, very expected. You can get some mouth sores very rarely, but again, once it starts, let us know so we can nip it in the bud. Um, the hyperpigmentation, which I think always makes people nervous, but it's not life-threatening and it just looks different, is the brown spots that can happen on hands, feet, um, and the gum line. And it goes away once you stop the drug, but this is a normal side effect of 5-FU. With oxaliplatin, which I know many of you are familiar with, um, cold sensitivity can happen. That's probably the number one side effect of that drug. Um, it is something I warn every patient about getting this because we don't want them to experience that cold sensitivity. It can almost feel electrical in your fingertips and in your throat or mouth if you swallow something cold. So knowing that going into it and being able to preempt a symptom like that, of course, will help with continuity and, and compliance as well. A little bit of jaw tightness um, can happen too when eating. Again, these are expected. We can walk you through these side effects. Um, and sometimes, you know, it is a new drug to your body. There can be reactions, which is why it's given in a safe, controlled environment with nurses that are very experienced with these drugs and know how to monitor you and make sure that we're doing this safely. For Ironitecan or I run to the can, which every um, nurse has probably heard out there, one of the biggest side effects is diarrhea. Um, again, the treatment modalities have changed along a lot over the last 10 years or so. So we have pre-medications that we use now to slow that down and prevent it from happening. Um, and then abdominal cramping. Um, so I don't say any of these to alarm anybody, but just know that we expect them to happen and we have ways to help you get through those side effects. So let us know if that is happening. The other most common regimen we use combination is gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel or abraxane. For gemcitabine, one of the most common things we see is low-grade fevers after the infusion, maybe a day or two. So, you know, going home and making sure that if you have these 99, even low 100 temperature, it can be expected with gemzar or gemcitabine. Um, you can usually treat it with Tylenol, but to be on the safe side, we always say still call. You know, we can work through the first few doses of it if it's a recurring thing and we know it happens every time for two days and you have a fever of 99, then we know you in particular and how you're tolerating the drug. But we don't ever want you to just push aside a fever. We would rather talk you through that side effect. Myelosuppression or bone marrow suppression um, is common with gemcitabine which is why we monitor your white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Um, those labs will be drawn before every treatment to make sure that your bone marrow is ready to receive the treatment. And fatigue, which I think unfortunately comes with almost every treatment that we give. Nabpaclitaxel or Abraxane, um, one of the biggest ones with this drug is hair loss. And while it can happen to some patients on other regimens, this is something very important to bring up when you're talking about the initial treatment regimen, because there are people out there that do not want to lose their hair, and that is understandable, and it's something that we need to know from the beginning, because we need to be able to choose treatment regimens based off of the patient's wishes as well. Um, so hair loss does happen with Abraxane. Neuropathy, um, which can also happen with oxaliplatin, the numbness and tingling of the fingers and toes is very common with Abraxane and something that we need to watch 
um, because it can be a cumulative toxicity. So making sure that you're reporting that you know my toes are a little bit numb or now it's moved up my foot. Um, what we don't want is for you to, or the patient or caregiver to not tell us that and fear that we're going to hold treatment because there are modifications that we can make um, again, it's just about being safe and being effective and finding that nice combination. A little bit of ankle swelling and edema can happen with Abraxane. Um, so rashes, again, these are very rare. Um, we don't expect these all the time, but again, if we do see them, we know how to treat them. And, and nausea and vomiting, um, which we have medications for. You get IV pre-medications to prevent that from happening. Um, but again, letting us know if what you have at home is not working so that we can make modifications. So I know Lauren um, talked to in her discussion too about some of these targeted therapies. Um, immunotherapy is, is a topic of conversation across the oncology world now, not just in pancreatic cancer, but in a lot of solid tumor types and, and hematology as well. But this is a test that we can do on your tumor type or in this next generation sequencing or molecular profiling to see if you have this this particular mutation that would make immunotherapy an appropriate treatment option for you. Um, it's not always used up front, especially if the disease is growing a little bit more fast. We want to use something like chemotherapy that we know can cool the tumor down faster. Um, but immunotherapy is a conversation to have with your own medical oncologist if they feel like it's appropriate for you. And it is not for everyone, um, which I think is a very common question that we get. But we don't want to use a drug that could add toxicity if it's not going to benefit you. Um, so the immunotherapy side effects are a lot different than with chemotherapy or cytotoxic treatment. Um, they're all these opathies, or um, that we like to call them, this um, gastrointestinal uh, side effects. The diarrhea is different than what you would see with aronotecan. Um, it can be cumulative, and it typically is not to be mistaken for just an episode or two a day. Um, it can escalate quite quickly. Um, again, this is very rare. We don't see this that often. I personally have maybe seen it once in the last six years, so it's, it's not that common. But when it happens, we know how to deal with it. Um, liver function tests, which we will monitor as you're going through treatment as well. If there's any trouble, any shortness of breath or rash, um, that of course could be due to immunotherapy and any hormone changes. Um, we do monitor thyroid function pretty quickly while, while patients are on treatment with this immunotherapy because it can alter your thyroid function. And again, we, we know how to modify that and treat it if needed. So the symptoms during treatment, different from the side effects of treatment, um, a few things that we're watching for, um, not just for side effects and toxicity, but to monitor if we feel like the disease could be changing or growing a little bit. Always tell us, you know, if and we'll ask as well any increase in abdominal pain, especially this very textbook um, epigastric or mid-abdominal pain that wraps around to the back. Um, pancreatic cancer symptoms are very subjective and can be very telling as far as what the disease is doing. And our patients are very in tune with their bodies and what symptoms they're feeling. So if the pain's getting worse, um, especially despite pain medications, we need to know that. Um, of course, we consider the source. It could be constipation. Um, it could be treatment related, um, which is very rare. Um, but constipation is a big one that can cause a lot of abdominal pain. So just, again, opening up that conversation with your treatment team to determine what the source might be. Lack of appetite. This, again, can be a few different things, whether not necessarily just from the disease itself, but if there's thrush sometimes, I always tell our patients if they have a sudden change in taste or um, if, if they're not able to taste things they used to, to go in the mirror and look at their tongue, a lot of the times they'll see a white coating on their tongue, which is something we can treat um, and bring that appetite and, and that sense of taste back. And depression, which is a big factor that, again, I think doesn't get brought up as much as it should, but this is such an overwhelming experience for a lot of people, and it's something that you've never dealt with before. So really discussing depression and making sure that if we can start treatment, um, that can take a little while to kick in. So the sooner we're more open about it, and the sooner the conversation starts, the sooner you can get benefit from it. Um, and then fever, of course, whether it's gyms are related or possibly because your white count is low, we always want to know if you're having a fever. 
So some of the tips um, that I share with, with our patients here um, is that it is absolutely okay and encouraged for you to advocate for yourself. You know, it should be a conversation with your oncologist, whoever you feel most comfortable with, to bring up your concerns, to bring up if you want to talk about a treatment or a possible clinical trial. We, we realize this is your life. You know, this is something that you need to feel comfortable with in your treatment plan and your treatment team. So advocating for yourself is always encouraged. Um, reporting your symptoms that don't resolve quickly. We would much rather talk you through an early symptom and treat it and get rid of it quickly than you trying to deal with it at home um, and ending up in the emergency room. So if it's something that we can help minimize and help with the treatment, then we would rather do that on the phone than you suffer through it at home alone because that's, that's truly what we're here for. Um, exercise at your own pace and tolerability. I know some of our patients exercise more than I do, which is always very impressive. Um, it makes me question myself a little bit. <laughs> but exercise at your own pace. Everybody's different. You know, whatever you feel like you can tolerate, whether it's walk to the mailbox and back, or if you're riding a bike down the strand, which I know things are a little bit different right now, but they will get back to normal. Um, and be honest about your mental health during treatment, um, your wishes, your goals, so that we as a treatment team know how to best support you through the journey. Um, telling us if at any point in the treatment, bring up your concerns so that if, if if nothing else, we can reassure you, um, but also be there to support you on whatever treatment decision you make. So that is, that's my spiel here. Um, I wanna thank everyone again for listening and I know um, I'll let Amy jump in. Thank you, Lauren and Megan, that was fantastic. Great, great information. So now we'd love to uh, open open the discussion up to any questions that you may have. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask. Hi, Amy. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, I'm Jetty Gans. We talked on the phone. Nice to see you, Jetty. I have a question, two questions actually. Uh, about 18 months after I had my surgery, I had to have my thyroid removed because I had cancer in my thyroid. And I remember the, the nurse spoke about that. And another question is after my surgery and now my treatment, if I would eat too much or drink too much a little bit, I would have pain on my right side. And I wanna know if that has anything to do with the surgery. Megan, do you want to do the thyroid one or you want me to go with the surgery? Um, do you want to start with the surgery one? Okay. <laughs> hi, Jenny. Um, so Jenny. I get that. Hi. I get that complaint a lot. I get um, a lot of people um, that tell me they have like a stitch feeling either on the left or the right. Sometimes people just have these vague abdominal complaints after surgery we've done CT scans, we do blood tests, and a lot of times it's just um, unfortunately something that patients experience after surgery. It, it, a lot of times it doesn't really mean too much. Um, it could be just the rearranging. What surgery did you have? Did you have a Whipple? Yes. Yeah. October 2013. And I went to my gastro doctor and he told me that I, when I'm eating, I shouldn't talk too much because I'm inhaling too much oxygen. Yeah. So sometimes the things that help with that is he's right. Maybe not talking and drinking from straws the chewing gum, because that's when people um, swallow a lot of air. Um, but the other thing is, and I think Megan really spoke about this is um, eating small, but frequent meals um, and just kind of monitoring that pain. If it becomes worse, or if you start having fevers or become nauseated and to the point where you can't keep down any food, I think that's when you should have a conversation with one of your healthcare providers. But I hear that a lot. It's a normal, normal finding and complaint after surgery. Thank you. And the other thing with the thyroid, I, I heard you were mentioning with the thyroid that it's some sort of a connection between with, with the pancreas cancer and, and that I had to have my thyroid removed. So were you, you know, the, the main correlation we see a lot of the time between thyroid and pancreatic cancer is if there's an immunotherapy treatment um, that was involved. Did you ever have immunotherapy? 
I have no idea. Okay, so that, that's a question too for your oncologist. Of course, we have seen things where you just end up, people end up having thyroid nodules coincidentally while they're going through treatment, unfortunately, and ends up being completely unrelated. Um, but we do, um, the question would be, and then the reason we monitor thyroid on treatment a lot of the time is just if patients are on immunotherapy and they start to have some level of thyroid dysfunction that we have to correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question for you, Megan. The information you gave was so, so wonderfully detailed. And I wonder if you have any kind of a pamphlet of your presentation that can be presented to the patients. Sure, I have a, a kind of condensed version of that that I, I give out to some of our patients here that I'm happy to share with, with all of you if you want to share it on the website, just as, as pearls. I know um, one thing, the reason we probably haven't distributed that across the board is different providers have different medications and, and symptoms that they like to discuss. So it's not always streamlined um, between providers, but I think it's enough that I'm happy to give you um, just the basic information that we kind of presented today to at least bring us talking points for our patients and, and to feel more prepared about the symptom, symptom management. I, I, I think it basically offers self-help if, if you, you, you have a certain pain. Flip through your little book and figure it out. And I can say, um, just for everyone here too, there's a really good, um, the National Cancer Institute, Chemotherapy and You, has a really good booklet um, that talks about dietary modifications and ways to deal with symptoms while you're on treatment. You know, if you're nauseous, these foods are better. If you're constipated, these foods might be better. And so it's a really good comprehensive booklet um, to review as well. I don't, I don't see the screen where uh, people can ask questions. Am I missing something? Um, that's a chat button, Aggie, at the bottom. We don't have any written questions right now. Okay. Um, I have a question. I have a question about telemedicine right now, um, Megan and Lauren. If I hear from someone out of state and they're interested in coming to the IPU, which is not unusual, um, how is that handled now? Are you able to do that through telemedicine out of California? Yeah. So um, in light of COVID, um, the federal government has lifted a lot of its restrictions on telemedicine. So typically we're not allowed to practice in a state we're not licensed in. Um, so if we were to do a telemedicine consult in Las Vegas or Nevada, um, we were unable to unless, you know, myself or, you know, the provider was also law, uh, licensed in Nevada. But now that the government has lifted those um, restrictions for that for this time period, we are able to um, do telemedicine. Um, I still screen every patient and make sure they're appropriate for a telemedicine visit, but we're doing a lot of telemedicine visits as I believe Megan is with Dr. Weinberg. Yes. Great, thanks. Sid had a question, but it disappeared. Um, we have a question in the comments. It says, you mentioned that patients should report symptoms that do not resolve themselves. How long should a patient wait before reaching out to their healthcare team with a concern? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, typically, depending on the symptoms, so if it's diarrhea or vomiting, if it's more than two or three episodes that aren't resolving, even during that day, we would rather hear about it within that first 24 hours of these symptoms starting. Because especially depending on where you're at in surgical recovery too, you know, your electrolytes can change quite rapidly. Um, if it's within the 24 hours and your diarrhea or um, vomiting is more than three episodes, I personally, and I know many providers would rather you call within that first day. Um, this is not something that we want to go on for days. Um, of course, if it's pain, um, we, we want to know about the pain changing as soon as you can. You know, we don't, I don't, I always feel terrible when patients come in and they say, I've been hurting for two weeks um, and they just waited to come in to talk about it, which, which makes me always feel bad because we, we truly would rather know these things sooner rather than later so that we can make adjustments and in real time 
um, because that's we all have a passion for this field. I know Lauren and her team does as well. And if we can adjust it sooner, we'd much rather do that. Second question. Wonderful. Um, Karen also had another question. How long do the effects of chemo last post-treatment, specifically the neuropathy associated with oxaliplatin? So the question, how long after the treatment? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm post I, I finished my treatment in September and I had a really, um, my body did not care for that drug much. I, I had very strong reaction to it. Sure. But I still have a lot of neuropathy and edema and, and I'm just curious. I know everybody's probably different and everything, but I'm just wondering if that's going to stay with me forever or is it really going to subside? You know, every, every patient's really different when it comes to their level of neuropathy and at what point in the severity of the neuropathy was the drug stopped, um, which I know is always a balance between trying to be effective and also trying to balance um, the side effect. You know, we do have patients, did you say, was it a braxane or oxaliplatin? Oxaliplatin. So oxaliplatin, and I think this isn't discovered or talked about a lot, is that it can actually peak for three to six months after the drug is stopped before it starts to get better. Oh. Um, We've seen patients whose neuropathy continues to get better even two years after stopping the drug. And that's, that's not to scare you that it will last that long, but just saying that it can still start to improve even that far out. Well, um, if it's still around in two years, that's a good thing. <laughs> exactly. And acupuncture is always very helpful. Um, we've had a lot of people try that. So acupuncture is, is a good you know, non-medication non way to treat um, uh, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Of course. I'm just reading some of the questions too. Have you, Alyssa, there's four, four chats there. So are you there? Yeah, I think I got all of the questions that were in the chat. Um, there were some questions about making the slides available. This is being recorded, so that will be available shortly. Um, there was a private question about the stroma around pancreatic cancer. I know you mentioned that in the beginning, um, and the question was whether that is seen in other cancers or if that is sort of unique to pancreatic cancer. Um. So, so there are varying levels of the complex extracellular matrix around different tumor types. To be perfectly transparent, you know, my, my um, experience is mostly in pancreatic and GI tumors, but a lot of solid tumors do not have this dense stroma around the pancreatic cell, which, which has made it such a difficult um, solid tumor type to treat. Um, that is why we try to target that extracellular matrix and this, this fibroblasts and all of these things that make up um, this really complicated matrix to get through for these pancreatic cancer cells. But as far as, you know, as how it compares to a lot of other solid tumors. It is more, one of the more complex ones. I won't say that none of the other solid tumors are like that, but it, that is one of the um, most difficult aspects of a pancreatic cancer cell. I hope that at least partially answers the question. Wonderful. What do you think? Any, shall, we, shall we just say thank you so much to both uh, Lauren and Megan. Uh, all the information was some, some of it brand new to me and obviously very, very informative. And I think everybody should get this handout. Um, and of course, we, we really appreciate you being with us today. We know uh, your time is precious at UCLA and I know you guys are on all full speed. Um, anyway, thank you, thank, Aggie. It was nice to be so here. Much. Okay, and now for my problem is that I don't see the guests.
I just see the names of the guests. I don't get to see the faces of the guests. <laughs> so what 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 am I doing wrong? What? Oh, there's Michelle. There you go. There's Barbara. Oh, Hi, Barbara. Okay. I mean, the best part of the best Aaron, part is seeing you guys. Everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we, have, we, have to hit, uh, we have to hit video for us to show. We all okay. have to hit video. Okay. Okay. So um, this, the, you know that we're continuing the, with the Zoom meetings. Two more are coming up with Dr. Mark uh, Gerges from uh, UCLA Surgery, Surgery and Wendy Conlin from Genetic Counseling. And uh, we'll be giving you a heads up on when those are. Uh, and I know you know that we're all here for you and doing the best we can uh, to be of help. Uh, even when we're all whole, whole, homebound and uh, just take, please take extra precaution to stay safe. Yes, thank it was you. an honor. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. This was great. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Megan and Lauren, and for all of you for showing up. Thank you, thank you Amy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.